Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is Pentecost Sunday, the Sunday in which we remember God's uh, leaving, Christ's leaving, uh, the Holy Spirit with us, God sending the Holy Spirit, and so we're dressed in red. We have confirmations. Our altar is dressed in red as a sign of the fire of the Holy Spirit. And it's this topic I want to take up with you today as I offer you just a few reflections, both on the day and a few of our lessons. So the first thing I want to start with is actually a story. It's a story I was uh, with a friend this past weekend, and we were visiting, and we were talking about... I I have no idea, actually, how we got on this story. I thought I could, like, pull that up, and that's just not there. I don't know what non sequitur it was, but we arrived on... uh, Sabin Sunday, Sabin Oral Sundays. I wonder if anybody in this congregation is old enough to remember Sabin Oral Sundays. So I'll tell you what it is. In 1960, millions of families across the United States walked out of their church doors and lined up or they went to the public schools and libraries, and they did this across the country. And they arrived and each took a little sugar cube with the polio vaccine on it. All right? You know, some of you remember the sugar cube more than you did Save and Oral Sundays, didn't you? All right, exactly. This, this, this vaccine became so popular because Dr. Sabin had created something you could take. The first time they did it, if you went to one that didn't use the sugar cube and used only a spoon, you got a commemorative spoon, which is kind of wild, you know. Uh, but I guess they didn't know what to do with the spoons. So they decided they'd give them away. But needless to say, what happened was that they were uh, taking uh, this life-saving polio vaccine. Uh, Jonas Salk, of course, had developed the polio vaccine in 1953, but it was Sabin's, as I was saying, that has became the most popular. In fact, it's the one that's still used today in countries around the world to stop polio outbreaks. It was perhaps the most successful immunization program in the history of the United States. We as a nation do not particularly remember that we eradicated polio together, halting it worldwide, stopping over 500 deaths in that year alone. Five million cases of paralyzed children. Some of you probably have seen children in iron lungs, right, to save them. Uh, There is a wonderful story on NPR about all this, in case you want to check my facts. But here's the point that I I want to draw on, is that people literally, on Sunday, because in the 1960s, most people still went to church, left their church buildings to help other people. They saved themselves, and they saved the world by an act of goodness. Think of the blessing this was for families who were living in fear of their children catching polio. Think of the peace that was brought to the whole world with the idea that we could eradicate one of the most deadly and debilitating pandemics. The families and children of the world found a little peace. What I'm suggesting is that God desires and has desired that the three Abrahamic faiths, that is Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, go into the world to multiply blessings of peace. Let us think uh, now of the creation narrative of Babel, 
You all know the story of Babel, that story where God gets really angry because the people are building this big tower, right? It's a creation narrative because it tells us about how we get all the different language, right? It's, it's, a, it's a story in God's narrative about how that happens. And, God's, and when I grew up going to Sunday school, people told us that it was because they were making a tower so that they could become like God. But uh, what I'm going to suggest to you today is that's actually not what the story is trying to tell us. That if we go back far enough into the ether, if you will, what we find is in the, a better translation of the text and in some of our ancient theologians and rabbis is that uh, what God is displeased with is that they are gathering together in a city. They're huddling together. They're not going out into the world. That God had sent people, humans, out into the world to multiply God's blessing of shalom, that God was sending people out to create peace in the world, that this was part of what God's sending out was doing. And that by huddling together in the city, right, they were actually breaking what God had intended them to do. And so God creates this moment in which they are dispersed with many languages, right, to go back out into the world. Not because of the tower, but because God has a vision of what we do together, which is spreading peace and love in the world. Now, let us consider the story that we often tell of the upper room. Now, there are two different stories of the upper room. One of them we read today, right, with the different languages, that they're in the upper room and that uh, uh, Jesus, the Spirit, appears in fire, hovers over their heads, they're sent out into the world, right, and people think they're drunk. Like, it's like too early in the day for you to be drunk. This is crazy. You're all speaking these different languages. And there was a, a, a feast going on at the time, but people were there from all over the world so they could understand, right? So typically the way we've been taught, uh, oh, well, the second story is that Jesus appears in the upper room and breathes on them. And in that, so we have the fire, sends them out in language. We have the other story that says Jesus appears and breathes on them and says, peace be with you. Ah, right? And sends them out. So what I suggest is uh, the church often thinks, ah, this is the great ingathering, the undoing of Babel. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is that it's not. It's the same thing. That God doesn't actually intend us to huddle together, whether it's in the upper room or in cities by ourselves where we cordon each other off and we separate ourselves from the world, but that God intends us to leave and go out into the world to multiply God's blessing and love. Actually, the Pentecost story is a redoing of what God is, keep, is trying to make us do all the time. Uh, so uh, I offer that today we are confronted with so many problems, are we not? I mean, I, could, I just say that. I bet you have your own list. You could just make your list and it could be any number of major communal problems that we're suffering from, right? And you've come here to get a little peace. That's what this is for. You come here to find a little peace. But God does not intend you to stay here where it is peaceful. Where you are protected from the world. God intends you to go out and to change the world through the sharing and multiplying of God's love and peace. Now, when we have great moments of trial, as we do, you all in church like to look at me or people with funny collars on or politicians and ask what we're going to do about it. But I offer that nothing's going to change until the people of God walk out into the world and make change. The one solution we haven't tried is all of us sharing peace and love and working together 
to solve our communal problems. That is not a political statement. <laughs> that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the point of Pentecost. That is the point of Babel. That you are God's hands and feet. In 1960, people walked out of their church and literally changed the world for good. Today, we need peacemakers. We need people who will bring blessing and not division. Our world needs leaders to speak of a different way of loving and caring for each other, especially the least among us and for our children. In baptism and confirmation, we remember this call. Listen to the words. We're all going to commit to it again today, over and over again. Our commitments and our prayers that we say all fall in line with this great mission. The question for the church, for St. Albans, for each of you today is echoed throughout God's narrative from the very beginning to the very end in God's end gathering. When you leave here this Sunday and every Sunday, how will you this week multiply God's blessing, God's peace and shalom, God's love in the world. And it doesn't have to be in big ways. It can be in small ways and medium-sized ways. It all starts with us. So I leave you with this. How will you change the world this week? Because it's up to us and God's Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.